Let's talk in a little more detail about six particular texts that uh, are central elements of what I've been calling America's symbolic constitution. The claim is not that they are in every way exactly like the written constitution. The written constitution is unique, it's special, it, it towers above everything else, um, and where it is clear, it trumps. But where there's ambiguity in the written constitution, these other texts come in, I argue, to, to help uh, uh, take up the slack, uh, fill in the gaps. Take the Declaration of Independence. Um, it says very famously that there, that there should be no taxation without representation. That's one of the reasons that we're revolting from uh, uh, England is that the Parliament and the King have conspired to try to impose all sorts of taxes on Americans, and Americans, the colonists haven't voted for any of these things. They're being taxed without representation. Now, um, that idea helps us understand, yet again, for example, the rightness of McCullough versus Maryland on uh, one of the questions in the case. Remember, one question is, once the federal government has set up a national bank, are states allowed to impose discriminatory taxes on that bank? And Marshall says, no, they're not. Um, and you might say, well, Professor, you don't need the Declaration of Independence for that. You've got the Constitution Supremacy Clause. But Marshall doesn't rely um, uh, solely on the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution that says federal law trumps state law. And here's one reason why. The federal law in McCulloch creating the bank did not in so many words explicitly say states can't tax it. Um, so if the federal law had said that, then it would be a simple, easy supremacy case, but, but this law didn't quite say that. So it was a little less clear-cut textually, um, but now some structural principles come in. And Marshall says, here's a structural principle. When Maryland is imposing a tax on that bank, it's basically that national bank that was created by the people of all the states. Maryland is, in effect, imposing a tax on Virginians who supported the bank and New Yorkers and, and Connecticut residents and Rhode Islanders, and that's, in effect, improper taxation without representation. Maryland can impose a tax on its own constituents, but it shouldn't impose a tax on out-of-staters. And a kind of an implicit appeal to this Declaration of Independence idea, which is very central um, in McCulloch when you read it, that it's one thing to impose a tax on people who vote for you, and if they don't like the tax, they can vote the bums out, it's very different to impose a tax on unrepresented persons. Take another um, um, area of law that, that some justices, Justices Scalia and Thomas, have, have raised um, an eyebrow about. It's called the Dormant Commerce Clause, and here's how it works. There is the so-called Commerce Clause in Article 1, Section 8, and it says Congress has power to regulate commerce among the states, interstate commerce. Fine, but the courts have construed the Constitution as a whole to say that even where Congress has not passed a law, even where Congress has been silent, has been dormant, has been sleeping, so to speak, there are certain things that states can't do that interfere with an integrated national economy. States, um, State A, for example, let's say New York, can't impose um, special and discriminatory taxes on soft drinks that are imported from Connecticut or New Jersey from out of state. Um, New York can't impose all sorts of burdens on uh, uh, out of staters in all sorts of ways and, and can't discriminate against out of staters in, in various ways. Even if Congress hasn't spoken, even if Congress has been silent, dormant, the Constitution itself as a whole is construed um, to prevent certain kinds of state discrimination against out of staters. And you might say, well, how did they make that up? One thing is even um, uh, that, that Congress has, I think, pretty clearly uh, uh, encouraged the court to do this. And, and Congress, if the court tried to get out of that business tomorrow, Congress would pass a statute saying, no, we want you to keep doing what you're doing because we can't pass a statute anticipating every single way in which every single state might interfere with an integrated national economy, but we want you to keep doing what you were doing. And if we didn't like what you've been doing, we could have easily changed it, and we didn't. Uh, but 
here's a different an, um, argument for the Dormant Commerce Clause, that it's an implementation of this idea of no taxation without representation. New York can impose all sorts of uh, dis uh, disadvantages and impositions um, and obligations on its own citizens because they're represented, but it really shouldn't be doing that to the people of New Jersey or Connecticut um, 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 or what have you because that's, in effect, a violation of this declaration idea of no taxation with represent without representation, uh, an idea that you see as a, um, in c iconic cases like McCulloch versus Maryland. Let's take the Federalist Papers. Um, they, I think, were a reminder that we have to read the Constitution as a whole because the Federalist Papers are meditation on the Constitution as a whole. Um, um, the Federalist Papers, the ones that were most influential, actually, were the early Federalist Papers that reminded us that we created a Constitution for national security, geostrategic reasons. Now, this, I think, can be deduced from the text of the preamble, which talks about a more perfect union and common defense from the language of Article One, Section 8, that talks again about common defense right at the very beginning as being important. So we see these traces in the text, but to the, in the text, but to the extent that there's any ambiguity about that, the Federalist Papers kind of come in and supplement that, and it's the early Federalist Papers that are the most important way before you even get to the Federalist Number 10, that basically say, we're forming an indissoluble union, and we're forming it for geostrategic and national security reasons, and that's the central point of the Constitution. And a case like McCulloch versus Maryland is going to come along and say, that's actually why you can have a national bank, because the national bank is useful for national security purposes. It's useful to help pay the army on site and on time. Um, so, so the Federalist Papers here help confirm, to the extent there's any ambiguity, the centrality of national defense, common defense, as a key constitutional purpose. Uh, let's take the Northwest Ordinance. This is one that you haven't perhaps been as familiar with. Um, this was um, uh, uh, an, uh, a resolution passed by the, under the Articles of Confederation in 1787. It was enacted at the very moment that the Philadelphia framers were coming up with the constitutional plan. And the Northwest Ordinance was a plan for how the, the states north of the Ohio River, or the territory north of the Ohio River, would eventually be turned into states and admitted into the Union. And these states would later become Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, um, uh, some parts, uh, Wisconsin, some parts of Minnesota. Um, and um, uh, as soon as the Constitution was adopted, uh, the first Congress in one of its very first statutes they said, we endorse the Northwest Ordinance, we now make it a federal statute because it had been passed under the Articles of Federation, but we approve it. Um, and this um, basically was um, a blueprint for um, the rest of westward expansion. Territories loomed very large in the early republic. The early republic of the United States wasn't just states, it was states and territories and the District of Columbia. And the Northwest Ordinance is a blueprint for how the states are going to be organized. Um, and it's, um, it's a kind of proto-constitution for the people of the Northwest. Um, it's it's um, um, a, a, a huge chain in the link connecting the biggest a uh, project of the entire um, early republic, which is taming the West, turning the West into a series of, of of democratic, republican governments that are going to be admitted on equal terms with the other states. It's, that's the biggest, basically, project before the Civil War. And the Northwest Ordinance basically is an early blueprint uh, for that. And it links um, that project up with what will become the next great project, which is ending slavery. Because, as I mentioned before, the Northwest Ordinance actually says, no slavery in, in the Northwest. Well, it's not, why, why would that matter today? Because we have the 13th Amendment, Professor. Well, the Northwest Ordinance says these states should not be in, from the West should not be treated as colonies. We shouldn't, on the East Coast, try to lord over our Western neighbors the same way that the Brits tried to lord over us. These states should be these territories should become states. The states should be admitted into the Union on an equal footing, on sort of equal terms, roughly speaking, with the with the earlier states. That's a deep constitutional principle, even if unwritten. And it's, and it's celebrated by the Northwest Ordinance. And here's what it means, for example, that if one day Puerto Rico has a very clean referendum saying we want to, by a, a, a clean majority vote, we want to be a state. 
Um, we don't want to be um, a, a kind of dependency anymore. Nothing in the written constitution actually requires that the rest of us say, okay, we're going to admit you as a state or let you go free. And, uh, the written constitution might permit, if, if you read it you know, strictly, America as a colonizing colonial power, but the unwritten constitution, the Northwest one, is saying, no, that's wrong. That's not what we're about. In, in our DNA is the idea that actually we should not lord over other peoples. If the people in Puerto Rico really want to be independent, I mean, we want to be a state, here's our choice. Admit them as a state, along with all the other states on equal terms, or cut them loose. That's our choice. We can decide whether we want them. But, but we can't lord over them um, indefinitely if they don't like that status. If they are comfortable with it, that's a different thing. That's with consent. Um, but the Northwest Ordinance might help us think through important issues going forward um, in a way that where the Constitution's text might be ambiguous, the Northwest Ordinance and its anti-colonial idea is more clear. So I've told you a little bit about the Declaration of Independence, a little bit about the Federalist Papers and what it might mean today, some, some applications on, on national security, the Northwest Ordinance. Let's take Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Um, the theme of this address, there are many themes, but, but one of them is all about sort of life and death. He's at a graveyard, um, a cemetery. He's presiding over a certain um, commemoration, memorial ceremony. Bodies are being put in the ground. And he is talking about how out of this death and destruction, you know, we, the living, have to um, rededicate ourselves um, and find meaning, find new purpose. We, the living, need to experience what Lincoln will call a new birth of freedom. He begins with the birth imagery. See, four score and seven years ago, um, our father brought forth on the, brought forth. Um, like um, bringing forth a baby on this continent, a new nation conceived the birth image and liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We were born as a nation committed to a, a certain idea of equality. And then at the end, he says, we must have a new birth of freedom amidst all this death and destruction, a new birth of freedom. And the 14th Amendment is going to play off of those words. It's going to begin it's n this new birth of freedom with freedom at birth. Everyone born in America, that key word, is born a citizen, born f a free citizen, born a free and equal citizen. So I think when you read that first sentence of the 14th Amendment through the lens of the, of the prism of the Gettysburg Address, you see the significance of a certain word that otherwise you, you just might miss, this idea of born. We're born equal. This is Lincoln's gloss on Jefferson's idea that we're created equal. So what does that birth equality mean? It means the 14th Amendment means just what its text says. It's not limited to race. They could have said race. They say it in the 15th Amendment. But this says more generally, we're born equal. We're born equal male and female. Jew and Gentile, black and white, a deep idea that your status should not depend on, on the conditions of your birth, um, um, but instead, um, uh, uh, so, so if you're born third in the family, you shouldn't have lower inheritance rights than if you're born first in the family. Uh, no primogeniture. By the way, that's a principle of the Northwest Ordinance, too. And Lincoln grows up in the Northwest. That's, that's, that's um, uh, his... his uh, um, um, school teacher, in effect, is the Northwest Ordinance. His mother's milk, the Northwest Ordinance. So we are born equal. Um, and that idea, which you can see textualized in the 14th Amendment, is a meditation, is a reflection of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Lincoln's vision is being constitutionalized and textualized in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And if you want to understand the full significance of those written texts, you need to see them, read them through the prism of what Lincoln has been saying. Um, um, uh, 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 he dies um, and the nation experiences this new birth of freedom. I'm going to come back to that picture of Lincoln at the very end of this lecture, as, as we always uh, come back to the, the pictures at the end of chapters. Uh, but before I do, let me just say a couple of words about Brown versus Board of Education uh, and the I Have a Dream speech, both of which try to to carry forward Lincoln's vision and do so in very interesting and distinctive ways. Uh, Brown, of course, is a meditation on that idea of equality, um, of birth equality, um, particularly with a, 
reference to racial equality, that we're born equal, black and white, and the government should not be in the business of saying whites are born above blacks, that they, should be, and that they are born lords and blacks are born serfs. That's Brown versus Board of Education's meditation on Lincoln's idea. Uh, but even once you say, okay, the Constitution says equal, the written Constitution, and separate really isn't equal, the government shouldn't be in the business of separating the races in order to create inequality. We, and you can say, even if you say the 14th Amendment is pretty clear about that, what about the further question of whether the government has an affirmative uh, duty or in the government should in some way be encouraged, not merely to avoid racial segregation and separation by law, um, but what about the idea that the government actually should affirmatively encourage integration of the races, uh, bringing together of the different races? Is, does the 14th Amendment require that or, or encourage government to go that far to, to, to say integration as opposed to mere desegregation, but affirmative integration is, is actually um, a, 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 a special constitutional value? I'm not sure the 14th Amendment's um, words say that. I think there's some real, there are different possible interpretations here. We, we come again to the idea that sometimes the written constitution is quite ambiguous. It says equal, but I'm not sure it really says integration in a strong way. And separate can, in some spheres, in fact, even be equal. Think of sex segregation in, in sports teams, in locker rooms, and, and gym classes, and so on. So separate, in theory, can be equal sometimes. Um, and even if um, uh, the government shouldn't be in the separation business. Sh do we want to go further and say the government should be actually in the integration business? So not sure the 14th Amendment is so clear. The 15th Amendment does say that blacks and whites are going to vote and vote equally and therefore be in the same room when they're voting in a legislature or um, they're going to be deliberating together in a, jury in a jury room or sitting together in a jury box. But, but those arguably are more modest spaces of integration. That's not the entire world. That's the legislature. Um, that's the, the, the jury deliberation room. That's the jury box. Uh, but once we understand that Dr. King's speech is an important element of our symbolic constitution, I think we do see a little bit of a of, uh, of the pull of a more affirmatively integrationist vision, more affirmatively integrationist, frankly, than anything in the written constitution, strictly read. On that day, Dr. King ends by summoning up a vision, his dream. His dream is of black boys and white boys, uh, black girls and, and white girls, all of God's children joining hands touching each other, being together, joining hands, integrated, and singing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And it's not merely that his vision, his words are integrationistic, um, the, 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 the optics are integrationistic too. That's the day in which Americans of, of different races are actually coming together um, in D.C. to, to um, uh, call for civil rights and voting rights. Um, America is witnessing, as King is speaking, uh, an integrationist moment, a joining of hands across the racial divide, a vision not merely of liberty and equality, but a vision actually of genuine fraternity, of, of, of racial integration and solidarity, far more explicit, I think, or, and more vivid than probably anything in the written Constitution, but an important element of today's unwritten constitution, of our constitutional culture uh, surrounding the, the terse text. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, just in conclusion, back to Lincoln. This picture of Lincoln is taken uh, just um, weeks before he delivers the Gettysburg Address. It's 150 years ago, it's November. 1863, so almost exactly 150 years ago this season. And uh, I just want to step back and, and suggest that although we talk a lot about the founders, we talk about 
James Madison, who's father of the Constitution. We talk about Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence. They were slaveholders. They died as slaveholders. They did not free their slaves at their death, unlike Washington, who tried to take steps in that direction. Jefferson and Madison found a political party that's based basically on slavery. It gets its votes on the southern side. That's where their political bread is buttered. Their party will become the party of Jackson, Andrew Jackson, the party of Roger Taney and Dred Scott. It will drive America over a cliff because of, um, of its pro-slavery tendencies, and, and the system will almost die as a result of that. We call that near-death experience, the Civil War. And in its ashes, it is reborn. America experiences a new birth of freedom, thanks to this man, Lincoln, who generously gives the credit to Jefferson. He says that he's just you know, building on Jefferson's idea that all men are created equal. But, but Jefferson never walked the walk, really, as, as president or ex-president. Um, maybe he talked the talk. Um, Jefferson is a complex character, but what you need to understand is that our Constitution today isn't really James Madison's, isn't really Thomas Jefferson's. Their Constitution failed. We today, my fellow Americans, live in Lincoln's Constitution. There was a house that was divided against itself because of slavery. It fell because of slavery. It was rebuilt. We call that rebuilding the Reconstruction. It's a new birth of freedom superintended by Lincoln. He lives to see the 13th Amendment proposed but not ratified. After his death, a 14th Amendment codifies his vision that we're all born equal, created equal. A 15th Amendment um, um, constitutionalizes almost his last wish in his last public address. He actually says, you know, I think the blacks should actually have voting rights. Um, uh, um, um, equally with whites in, 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 in many situations. He had said that public before. He had believed it. He had, he had grown. He had evolved over the course of his presidency. This was not a position he had early on, but this was one that he came to when he shared with um, uh, an audience uh, uh, two days before his assassination, maybe three days before his assassination. And the 15th Amendment codifies that vision. The 14th Amendment codifies that vision. We today, my fellow Americans, live in Lincoln's house, a house where equality is at the center. Um, not just racial equality, but broader forms of equality, of, of birth equality. Um, so even though sometimes we give the credit to Jefferson and Madison, as I said, I think we really live in, in Lincoln's house. He the man. Um, well, Professor, you said all men are created equal. You said he the man. What about women? What about women indeed? That's what we're going to talk about in the next chapter, so stay tuned.